Um, we're still waiting on Representative Bergkamp. I haven't been able to get a hold of him, but if you don't mind, just in the interest of time, if, if you wouldn't, we could go ahead and get started discussing a few items and we'll. Uh, that would be fine, Mr. Chairman, okay. if you're comfortable with that. Thank you. Um, first of all, I did confirm with the uh, staff and, and, and yourself that the Senate has adopted or put the conferees on the three bills that we have in play, which are Senate Bill 410, House Bill 2096, and 2098. So we do have those bills. Um, if it's no difference to you on which bills we use for what provisions, uh, we could go ahead and take, um, doesn't matter, Senate Bill 410 for the non-controversial pieces. But I'd, I'd totally defer. If you have any objection to that, we can put them in a House bill. Uh, actually, Mr. Chairman, I would, um, that would be fine with me because I actually made that bill in request. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we will um, put the provisions that we had kind of tentatively agreed on uh, with the kind of the administrative package into Senate Bill 410. Uh, just for reference, do you, do you want staff to go ahead and review all of those provisions? Um, no, I think we're good on them. Um, the only thing that we did have question on was the housing investor tax credit uh, transfer cleanup. Okay. Um, if we could go over that provision, unless you guys want to go through them all. I, I'm, I'm comfortable with what's in writing. I'll see if there's any. Do you guys have anything you're wanting to give her? No, I'd be happy to. Yeah, we can cover We don't have any questions on any other pieces. So if we want to go over the, the housing uh, credit, that would be acceptable. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. We'll look at staff, see who wants to take the lead on that. <laughs> House Bill 2832 relates to the Kansas Housing Investor Tax Credit. And that credit... Um, it allows that credit to be transferred in the year in which the credit was issued. Um, that credit is already fully transferable, but uh, the way the statute currently reads that those transfers can be made in years following in which the credit was issued. And this would allow them to be made also in the year in which the credit was issued. Um, it, because they are already fully transferable, the, the bill is anticipated to have no fiscal effect. So, um, Mr. Chairman, we're fine with those provisions. Um, we had talked about the income, the other portion of the, that passed in that same bill last year, maybe putting a possible limit on it um, because of the legislative post audit. Right, you took me a minute to jog my memory, but that's the one that we had discussed in the interim committee as well too, okay. Um, I think would be favorable to that. Do you have a like an income th or a threshold on that limitation that you want to propose? Whatever you want to suggest. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I think the limit on this one was 13 million. Do we want to be consistent and put that on? Just so it's a true 13 million and we don't try to do the subcategories that are in the other one. Would that be correct? Yeah, because there, there are some sub pieces to that based on, I think, population, if I remember right. I might have, maybe, be a good idea to have Eddie review that if, if he can, maybe not. <laughs> Didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but. No, that, that's fine. I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, at the bill itself on, on page two of House Bill 2832. It, it refers to the, the uh, credits issued shall not exceed $13 million each tax year. Um, except that that cap can be can be carried forward. If, if in year one, only $10 million were issued, the three million can be carried forward into the, into the following year. Um, it then provides that of that aggregate amount that the, those credits are supposed to be allocated across the counties of the state on a, on a per population basis with uh, uh, not less than 2.5 million to counties with populations of not more than 8,000. 
uh, not less than 2.5 million to counties with populations from 8,000 to 25,000 and up to 8 million to uh, counties with populations in excess of 25,000, but not more than um, 75,000. So th that's the, the way the, the cap works on the housing investor tax credit. The, the other one that I believe you're referencing is the affordable housing tax credit, which is also sometimes referred to as the, the low income housing tax credit. Yeah, Madam Chair, I think it's probably wise. I, I remember our conversation on that. Uh, maybe put a cap on that. I want to make sure that it gets distributed. So maybe we can put that that overall cap on it and come back next year and see if there need to be some uh, subcategories put in place also for that one. We can take a look at that next year. I don't want to dive into that right now, but I think a, an overall cap would be wise. I, I think so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I w would ask Eddie, what was the 10 year um, what was the issue with that? The accumulative over 10 years? Is that so is the cap 13 million a year or 13 million total is what we would be looking at. I just want to clarify the language. So, so the, the 13 million cap is in the housing investor tax credit and that is $13 million each tax year is the aggregate amount that may be issued under that credit. The, the 10 year. Um, so let me clarify on that. Um, when you say 13 million can be issued each year, so it's cumulative then, we could be 13, 13, so it could be 26, so we may have a problem on that one too, or is it 13? I, I, my understanding is that that one is 13, it's not a 13, 26. I just wanted right? to make sure, I know we've had problems with um, HPIP and PEAK and other program limits, not those two particularly, there was another one, uh, PEAK, but okay, thank you, Eddie. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, and I, I also know that the the legislative post audit report addressing these didn't did not flag that issue as it related to the housing investor tax credit, just the affordable um, housing tax credit. The, the ten year phenomenon there is that the amount of credit that is um, awarded can be claimed each year for for ten successive years following. I b believe when the housing project comes online, um, you know, is is resided in, and and so that is how it has kind of a, a potential compounding cost in terms of the annual cost to the state if it's if it under that one if it were about 25 million every year and it that happened for 10 consecutive years by the 10th year it could be 250 million in terms of the the annual cost to the state i'm i'm comfortable with putting that in place if if staff's comfortable with understanding the intent or I, I think staff might need some additional clarity in terms of, of exactly what your intent is as it relates to capping that one. I, I think that the concept of capping it, we, we understand, but because of the, the nature of that credit, we might need some specifics in terms of what, what your intent would be. It, it's, it's likely to be easier to develop those individually offline than trying to do it in this setting, I think, if, if, if everybody is uh, agreeable to that in terms of looking at the actual statutory language and having, having everybody have that in front of us when we try to, try to fashion those, those limits. So that would be great. We could um, give um, the idea now and then come back and, and firm up. Yeah, I completely okay. agree. I'd like to see the language to know what we're <laughs> passing before we <laughs> agree to it. But... And we can certainly meet with staff and answer any questions we need to on how that would function. Okay. okay. And I'll let you take point on that. And okay. That way we're negotiating everything. Thank you. Certainly. Okay. Um, one question I had for, for uh, the revisers on any of these provisions, some of these things were a part of Senate Bill 8. Do we need to have a motion or anything official to agree to allow you to kind of update any dates or anything where they were... Uh, I'm not sure which items might might or might not have some dates 
that would be older, but. Um, Mr. Chairman, as I recall, looking, uh, reviewing these particular provisions of Senate Bill 8, um, as I recall, the couple of provisions that do have dates included, my recollection is that there was a, there was a purpose behind the date that was included. It was not merely a tax year. It was, there was some rationale for that particular date. And so I didn't off the top see anything that um, I believe, unless you wanted to change one of those dates that would, that would need changing. Well, if I may, Mr. Chairman, Certainly. I think there might be a date issue like on the reimbursement for the revenue neutral. That would have to be up. To, oh, it's not. It's a, um, Mr. Chairman, the revenue neutral reimbursement um, in Senate Bill 8 was going to extend it for one year to 2024. Okay. And so if that's what you intended, then we could use the same language. Okay. That's true because it's it's currently at the same expiration right now, so that that would be accurate. Okay. Okay. Well, I will I will leave that up to staff. Maybe while we're working on this other language, if if there is anything that's found, uh, certainly want to give you the flexibility to make any technical changes that might be necessary due to that. Um, also, wanted to double double and triple check that we are including the uh, ag land adverse influence in this bill. I think that's all of staff's understanding. Yes, okay. that, that it's the, the top two sections and, right. and that line. So much more in there. And, and the only adjustment to the top two sections is the employee retention tax credit disallowance is, is 50%, but, but. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, it sounds like we have some a little bit of work left to do on that one, but we're pretty close, so we can move on to another package. Um, do you have a preference, Madam Chair, property or sales tax? Okay, let's take a look at property tax items then. Um, we have all of those pieces currently, other than the adverse influence, obviously. Um, So an easy one, Mr. Chairman, would be uh, Senate Bill 484. We could start with that in the property tax. I think it's an easy one anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah, I was just trying to think. We, we typically go back and forth with some offers, but we're trying to expedite this. So if there's things that we can't agree on, that might speed the process up a little bit. I think, because we had an amendment um, on the floor that, that had, I think, the contents of this bill. I wanted to clarify, and maybe, maybe Department of Revenue, the fiscal impact to the state is relatively small, but we do have a fiscal impact to the counties. Do we have a, a number on that? I was thinking it was around $13 million. Yeah, that, that's the number that the department has, has provided. It's, it, it's, I believe it's between 13 and $14 million in terms of the, the local impact. And of course, that's, that, that would be in essence a tax shift impact, not a tax reduction impact because the, the, lo the way local mill levies are calculated, that would just be shifted to other property. Whereas the, uh, the $2.8 million that is attributable to both the 20 mills and the one and the 0.5 mills, it would be an actual reduction. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did some reverse math on the floor, and I should never do that because I, I didn't think the 20 mills was included in that, and I, I was shocked with my incorrect calculations. <laughs> it, is, it is a reduction in the tax base. It's not an expense to the, to the local governments, but it is a reduction in their tax base, but 13 million spread out throughout all the counties. I would assume probably the, the higher population counties will see a more, um, more of an impact in that, but I, I would... I think 13 million is probably a, a, not a real cumbersome amount to, to impact them. Understanding, I remember when you carried on, on the floor, Madam Chair, a lot of the, the appraisers say that it, in the time and expense it takes to track all these things down and do the work, um, 
sometimes it's not worth the, the tax that they're receiving. So I think we can all agree on that provision. Okay, and, and to be clear, Mr. Chairman, we did amend it in the Senate to um, exempt 15,000 pounds or less on trailers. You have more experience with trailer weights than myself. We just thought we know that that amount, you can carry two horses. So, <laughs> but because people may not realize this, horse trailers are not exempt on personal property taxes. Okay. But cattle trailers are. I wonder what mine is. <laughs> I call it a livestock trailer. So <laughs> um, I might see if, not sure who's here from PVD, but for some reason I've got a, a number in my head of 12,500. I don't know if that's a, is there a cutoff right now on, on trailer weights and how they're taxed at, at 12,500? I, I believe the be antique anything. trailer exemption has a, a weight of limit of 12,000 is the cutoff point on it is, is my recollection. I think we enacted that, I want to say it was about three years ago. Um, and I believe that we, may, maybe two years ago, uh, that might've been uh, a part of 2239 two years ago, but I believe that was set at, at 12,000. We'll, we'll try to check that really quickly here while you're talking. Okay, I was just trying to maintain a little consistency. I, I understand if you have a couple of horses, you might want to uh, need the higher weight, but just trying to find a balance between that and not creating a, a lot of different weight ranges for folks when they go in to register. If there is a difference there, maybe we can take a look at that. But, um, Mr. Chair, Am Amelia, just uh, help me out. The antique trailers is eight, the gross weight of 8,000 pounds or less, not 12,000. Okay. So. Okay, um, would you remind me, we have here in our parentheses, ATVs, trailers, watercraft, et cetera. Would, would somebody be able to just briefly remind us what all is? Because I don't think it's all of that subclass. It's just specific ones. I think like golf carts and some other things are included as well. Yeah, it's... Uh Snow, this might, reading this might take a, a moment, but snowmobiles, all-terrain vehicles, recreational off-road, off-highway vehicles, golf carts, or motorcycles manufactured for off-road use only and used exclusively off-roads and highways that is not operated on any highway, motorized bicycles, electric assisted bicycles, electric assisted scooters, electric personal assistive mobility devices, motorized wheelchairs, uh, tra any trailer with a gross weight of 15,000 pounds or less being that is used exclusively for personal use and not for the production of income, any watercraft and any watercraft trailer designed to launch, retrieve, transport, and store watercraft, and any watercraft motor designed to operate watercraft on the water is the, the list from the bill. Okay. Madam Chair, when you had a hearing on this, I know one of the things that we got kind of hung up on in, in House when we had some hearings on, uh, not I think it wasn't specifically an exemption, but we had some uh, discussion on these ATVs and four-wheelers and stuff. Does this cover all of your, your off-road vehicles? Because there are so many different types out there. There's the side-by-sides. You have your standard quad, what I call a four-wheeler. You have things that look like dune buggies. I, I know there are, our appraisers struggle with what class, where do these fit in? Is there anything that, I was just curious from your discussion and your hearing, was we there did anything not that- not have that discussion, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, it was just, we just accepted the definition of all-terrain vehicles and um, yeah. Okay. Well, probably the best way would be to just see if there's anything that looks like it doesn't fit in these definitions. I know we can't predict the future and what's going to be designed or created in the, in the future as well, but uh, sometimes there's a fine line between what constitutes a passenger vehicle and an off-road vehicle. So. If, if it does help, Mr. Chairman, I do know that the veterans um, have some weigh-in on this and 
uh, they do have disabled veterans that have to pay property personal property tax on their uh, wheelchairs and stuff. So True. Um, there's, I have a constituent that's really gonna benefit from this. She pays more on her ATV property tax than she does on her home. So um, that was, but it was actually the appraisers association that brought this to me, not constituents. I'm just hearing from them now. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and I've, I've heard, the, I know a few appraisers too, and they, <laughs> this has been on one of their to-do lists to try to clean up this, this language. So I think a, an exemption probably is the, the easiest way to go. Because even if you reduce it to, you know, a 20%, right now they're assessed at 30%. If you reduce that, uh, you still have to go out and chase these things and, and no pun intended, but you have to find where these are and they have to be reported. They're on your personal property rendition sheet. Uh, seems easiest just to get rid of them. Okay. Um, as we look through things here, uh, I think one thing that we're probably pretty well in agreement on would be the property valuation notice additional years. Um, I will, I, I didn't have a chance to visit with Director Harper, but Amelia did, and I was going to see if she would kind of explain uh, some changes that we might, might need to make in that language to allow them to create that, that graphical um, document. Um, as you may recall, Senate Bill 8, the um, last year, the, the uh, proposed amendment was that um, the notice, the annual valuation notice that's mailed in the spring, um, currently includes separately for the current year as well as the previous year, both the appraised and assessed values for each property class on the parcel. And the proposed the proposal last year was to add that in addition um, to the current and previous it would be the previous two years and the current. Um, and I believe there was a bill, I believe that was possibly a compromise on the CCR that because there was a bill that maybe added four years um, earlier in the session. Um, from my understanding to include appraised and assessed values for each property class on a parcel to do it for more than the previous and current year takes a lot of room on the form um, because there are many types of parcels that are multiple classes. And so you have assessed, so you're appraised and assessed for each class for current and previous year. There's a lot of information there. So if, if it adds two more, you know, another year to that information, um, I guess there, the thought is possibly instead of using the language in the CCR, possibly creating another statement here, adding to the notice that possibly just allowing um, that the notice provide a statement or a display of the current and, you know, prior to three, four years um, of appraised valuation or something, total appraised valuation of the parcel, something along those lines so that it gives them the opportunity to work with their vendors on how they can display that. Um, but to break it down within the classes and both assessed and appraised is a lot of data. Um, and so it's just something for you to, to consider. Thank you, Amelia. And you did that much better than I ever could have. So thank you for, for uh, taking that on. But, you know, Madam Chair, it's my, my intention. I think it would be legislative intent to just make things as simple as possible so people can look at a graph or a chart and say, wow, that's, that's how this has changed over the past three, you know, if it's a graph, maybe they can fit five years on there um, and, and it doesn't require a second sheet of paper. But, you know, I want to respect the, the amount of information that has to go on there. But ultimately, I just want the taxpayer to, to be able to see a, a good, easy visual. Um, so I'm willing to work with the department if, if you are to get whatever kind of language placed in here that would allow them that flexibility. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, and I would love to see a five-year look back. I know that was the intentional, the original bill. Mm -hmm. um, we just did the three because of the page limit. But um, yeah, the flexibility to get that graph on there, that would be very helpful. Yes, I'd agree. So we might tentatively agree to that and let Amelia 
and Adam come up with the language that that needs to look like. If we do that, do you want to go ahead and move it to the five year or wait? Because I'm sure the vendors need time to kind of program. I don't want to get out ahead of our skis if, if they need time to work on that as well. Okay. Um, at this time, Madam Chair, I, th I think I'd like to take a look at um, the House Bill 2036, Disabled Veterans Property Tax Exemption. Okay. Um, I guess I'd like to make a statement thanking the Senate for their good work on this because the House did pass this as a property tax exemption. Um, after we did that, we became very aware through your diligent work identifying there's some constitutional issues perhaps. But more importantly, that really impacts the tax base in certain areas, certain counties and communities across our state. So I really appreciate the work that the Senate did on that to try to correct those provisions. Um, the sales tax um, that the Senate uh, had placed in there, I certainly understand the, the benefit that that provides to our disabled veterans. I think that that is a big advantage. Um, where we don't have that program currently in place, I'm not really sure how that would work. Um, I did try to go back and listen to all your hearings and everything, but Madam Chair, I, I did want to make a, a proposal or an offer to you. This is something that has not had a hearing, but it's, I'm trying to find a compromise here. Number one is if we create this as a refund program, rather than an exemption, that, that benefit will come from the state. It won't impact any local tax bases. And uh, almost for the sake of simplicity, if you're familiar with the, the Safe Senior um, Property Tax Refund Program, I would like to create a program very identical or very similar to that for our 100% disabled uh, who are what's referred to as total and permanent disability. Uh, these are the folks that are 100% disabled. Typically, if you are a, a total uh, disability, that means you've lost eyesight uh, in both eyes, you've lost the use of both hands or legs um, or feet. Uh, basically, you are unable to work. Um, I, I'm not familiar with, with all of the Veterans Affairs or Veterans Administration ratings, and I was I was thinking that 100% basically <coughs> mean, meant that you were unable to work. Uh, it's come to my knowledge that you can have 100% disability and still be functional and able to work, even though you might have some some restrictions on that. But I wanted to focus a program toward our veterans that need that the most, who have that uh, total disability. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to need to digest that a little bit, but sure. I appreciate your diligence on this. I know that we all support the veterans, and um, that sounds like it is absolutely something we could work with. Uh, it's kind of conceptual right now. I've been working with Adam to kind of get that draft, and once we have that finalized, we can take a look at that. I uh, apologize. It's kind of conceptual right now, but... No, it would... Um, it would be wonderful, and I actually spoke to a gentleman today. He um, he called me uh, just coincidentally, and uh, I asked, um, "Are you 100% disabled?" And he said, "Yes." And I said, asked, "Are you totally and permanently disabled?" And he said, "Yes." So, um, would this be a freeze, or it would be to modeled after the safe seniors? I'm trying to conceptually and. and open a negotiation, obviously. Uh, conceptually, I want to model it after the Safe Senior where it is a 75% refund. Uh, it won't be 100%. Uh, maybe we can expand it uh, down the road at, at certain points. But I wanted to start, start out offering a 75% refund uh, without income limitations or household valuation limitations. Okay, and I know this may not sound very important, but one of the issues we've run into with the Homestead 2 Act is the Homestead 1, Homestead 2. So I was wondering if you had a name for this that you would like to. 
I, I had a couple of that I came up with and, and I'm certainly open to negotiation, but I wanted to focus, I agree, we need a name for the program so it can be easily identifiable. I wanted to focus on uh, honoring the sacrifice and commitment and the courage of our veterans. And I had come up with the idea of the Veterans Valor Property Tax Relief Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll definitely consider that. Um, we might have you naming some of our bills in the future. <laughs> so, um, thank you. I, I look forward to looking at the provisions on that. Okay. So. So do you want to go on until, yeah. Um, we'll tentatively, uh, you know, the idea, the principle of it, absolutely. So we'll work on. Okay. okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll continue to work with Adam and get that draft finalized and uh, give you some actual language to look at there for consideration. Yeah, and the fiscal note, if you don't mind. I yes. hate to be the one to ask, but. Yes. Um, we have done some work with the uh, Veterans Affairs, getting some data. They don't have hard data on Kansas, but they do have kind of average proportional data that they can apply to estimate that number. But uh, we'll work with Department of Revenue to see if we can get their uh, information with that program to get a fiscal estimate on that. Madam Chair, the, that kind of I think that concludes our our uh, offers. I'd be willing. I know most of these others are, are some Senate positions. I've I've got some concerns about the rest of these provisions, but certainly willing to take offers and and discuss and negotiate further. If you have anything that you'd like to prioritize, well, we can start with the first one if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Um, we'd like to take a, a look at the the Golden Years Homestead Refund. Um, I can't thank you enough. Um, we were able to get that passed in 2022 and um, signed into law. And last year we tried to expand it and we lost it. And so I'm hoping that doesn't happen again. The tea leaves are starting to align. But I, I would like to um, at least... Hopefully, we can get this expanded, this program. Okay. Would you mind uh, what what limitations or thresholds do you have currently in uh, House Bill 2465? Yes. Um, Amelia, would you mind? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, in, um, in House Bill 2465, um, the, the provisions that would change are that the household income would exclude Social Security payments. The claimant's household income threshold would increase from $50,000 to $80,000. The appraised value of the claimant's homestead for the base year would increase from $350,000 to $595,000. There would also be an additional provision for increasing the upper limit of that appraised value threshold um, annually after the first year. Um, and then there is also a provision that would specifically provide that these changes would apply retroactively and extend the deadline for um, prior tax years so that claimants could file claims before April 15th of 2025. No, that's, thank you. Which is what we're doing. Yeah. Because that's a lot. Then we get this, then we get this. Did you give your number? Not yet. Not yet. I guess we get we're still working on that. 
And we'll be doing not one of these twenty thirty supplements, I don't think. We'll see what he suggests. Was the big one? Yeah, that's it. That's the one we're doing. Okay. So twenty thirty six is the mega bill. Madam Chair, um, after visiting, I think we are we are in agreement to uh, the provision to exclude Social Security income from the calculation. That that piece of this. Okay. Uh, take the Senate's position on that. Um, I, I also agree with the retroactivity and the extension that Amelia had talked about at the end. There, that's the extension to. Uh, request or apply for this. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, that would be correct. For, because of the retroactivity piece, um, claims for 22 and 23, um, their, the 23 deadline would have been April, well, will be April 15 of 2024. So for 22 and 23, it, ex it is extending the deadline to April 15 of 25. Yeah, I think the house, the house is okay with that. Um, so I want to make sure that people that didn't get in the program in 22 and 23, they're able to get in. That that's the intent. Correct. Of the yeah, that's that's my yeah. understanding. If that's what the language okay yeah. achieves. Because okay. I I think a lot of people don't know about the program. Is what we're finding out. Yeah, I I put it in some of my newsletters, and people are always. What's this new program? And part of that is the name. People go into, they think it's the homestead. Um, I can't remember what the name of the form is. I, I looked up the, that's, it's. K-SVR 40, or K-40, yeah. Yeah, you guys K-40 SVR, I think, for this one. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we need to do a better job of cleaning that up and renaming it, too. So, um I think I'm okay on the the income moving that from fifty to eighty thousand, and I would like to make a counter offer to uh, move the upper threshold to five hundred thousand and remove the the growth index. So I want to be clear, is the growth in this for the income? That's current statute. I know I shouldn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, just for clarification, in the current existing statute, um, there is a cost of living adjustment to the income threshold. That's existing law. The provisions of the bill would add an adjustment for the appraised value um, based on a 10-year average that, that, anyway, the language that's in here, that would be an amendment on the um, appraised value threshold. So, Mr. Chairman, we'd like to counter offer. We appreciate your offer um, on the ADK and everything, and we'll leave the provision for the growth. And then accept the 500K, if we could put the growth factor in it, and knowing that we will be coming back in a year or two and looking at this as a constitutional amendment so that it's not continuing to grow the program like it is. Okay, thank you for that. We'll, we'll take that into consideration. Um, while we're talking about that, do we have any current data on 
have the utilization of this program. I'm not sure if Department of Revenue has anything. Um, I know when we had our interim committee, we had some discussion on this. I couldn't remember how current that information was, though. But while well, we're considering your offer, if, if we could possibly look that up, if not, that's fine. So, uh, only in the Senate do you negotiate against yourself, no. Um, we talked about it. We understand the indexing issue, especially on the housing. If we could leave that on current law with the income and then uh, maybe negotiate 525 on the household value and just leave it, just freeze it, no indexing on it. Would that be more palatable? Well, I always appreciate creative thinking, so we'll we'll take that under, under consideration. Mr. Chairman, we can hear your hesitancy, and we're all in agreement. We'll just take the 500K, take the indexing out on it. So we'll accept your offer. Okay. Yeah, we tried. If I could also make another counter offer, um, wanted to name these programs kind of appropriately to what they do. Uh, same thing with the veterans program, the conceptual one that I, I had offered. Could we consider a, renaming this uh, something like the, the homeowner's property tax freeze so it identifies that it's, this is the program that kind of freezes your property taxes once you qualify. Uh, be willing to take that under consideration. Again, Mr. Chairman, I think we're gonna have you name our bills from here on out in the Senate. <laughs> yeah, we think that'd be fine. Thank you. So staff clear on that, we're at 500,000 with no indexing and 80,000 on the, the income level. Is there any other clarification? And 100% uh, Social Security exemption. Yes, okay. that piece and the retroactivity. Um, this is still the program that our, our veterans qualify without any of the age restrictions. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Madam Chair, I wanted to take just a moment and discuss Senate Bill 311. Um, I'll, I'll admit I haven't had a chance to, to go back and, and review the hearings and the, uh, the uh, debate on that. I agree with what that's trying to do, but that, that's a fairly large policy change that we haven't had a chance to have a hearing on in the House. Would you consider um, postponing that till next year so we can take a look and make sure we understand exactly what, what that is doing. I, I think reading through it, I, I understand we're trying to get the value of the property to the actual property, not necessarily the value of the, the business or the, the lease. Um, we're just trying to get it to the actual structure, structural value of the property. So Mr. Chairman, that is exactly what we're trying to do and somebody I don't know where it came from, but dark store theory, that was not the intent of this bill at all. In fact, it was a businessman from um, Western Kansas that brought this to us. He has, if you asked him what a dark store was, he would tell you he would, has no idea. And he does have several businesses. Um, I would like to, we actually, um, 
I'm hoping we can move on this. So if you guys would take a close look at it and see if there's some amendments you would want or something. Um, hopefully we can get at least most of the legislation. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm certainly willing to look at that. It's, it's one of those policies that's a fairly big item um, where we haven't had a hearing on it and really dove into it. I'll, I'll certainly take a look at that because I, I completely agree with the concept behind it. We need to value the property at what the property is worth. Um, if there are additional benefits because of whatever business is in that, you know, that's where you get the income tax and the sales tax from, from that business activity. So the value of the property should be, should be structural. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I do know you're fairly close to an appraiser. Maybe um, she might have an opinion on the legislation. <laughs> so um, if you wouldn't mind taking a look at it, that'd be great. Sure, I'm yeah. more than happy to. Thank you. It's nice to have experts that we can rely on. Yes, thank you. And not saying you're not an expert, I just know. I'm not sure my sister is either. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I think she is. Full disclosure, my sister's a, a county appraiser, so. <laughs> so, Mr. Chairman, um, if you, since you guys all take a look at that, that'd be great. I'd also ask if you'd look at the government competition piece. Are we proposing exactly what was in Senate Bill 8 last year? We do not have any changes. Okay. So it would be what was in, yes, CCR 8, yes. Let me confer with my, my uh, committee members here and, and we'll get back to you on that one. As you know, Madam Chair, that's, that's one of those things I've always, I've always been a little hesitant on. I think we could probably make some changes in that language, but I'm not sure. You know, we did pass it last year. Uh, it was vetoed and we weren't able to override it, but uh, I'm not sure if that's the piece that, that caused the veto or not. I, I don't think it was, but <laughs> uh, let us visit about that for a moment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, thank you. I might have a question for staff on the government competition piece. 
help me remember, was it was for child care facilities and I think restaurant facilities and um, and the oh the health clubs also. Was it just those three? Yeah. Child care center, health club, and restaurant um, were the three that were specified. Madam Chair, I think we will uh, go ahead and accept the government competition piece as, as it's been presented. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it'll be one of those programs that um, we will be working on for a year or two, but at least it's a start. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is the, Mr. Chairman, the payment under protest, uh, is that controversial? It, it is a little bit for the House side, although I'm working on, on trying to craft some language that we, we have some concerns on kind of the, the legal standard. If, if someone, uh, and I can't remember the, the proper terminology. One one is payment under protest, and the other one is kind of an equalization piece. If if someone takes a case uh, under their, the equalization and they lose, and then they take up another case under the payment under protest and they win, which which case takes precedent? What legal standard do you do you apply? Um, I'm trying to work with the revisers to see if we can determine that. If they have one or get the process started in one, but don't take it all the way through completion, that still allows that taxpayer to then pay under protest and and seek uh, a resolution under that faction. But as it stands right now, we'd we'd like to to uh, reject that, but we will come back with a counter offer. I'm going to work with the revisers to see if we can kind of create a good solution to where we're not overloading the system for sure, uh, make sure that we can take care of our taxpayers but not potentially overload the system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So that would be the provisions um, for property tax items? Yes. Okay. okay. So I, I know we've got a little bit of homework to do do you want to go on, move on to sales tax? Yeah, let's go ahead and get started on sales tax. <clears throat> um, when I had Eddie prepare these, uh, he kind of reordered these. They're not alphabetical. We have six there at the top that we had kind of tentatively discussed as maybe having agreement. I think the House stands okay accepting those first six if the Senate is is concurrable to that or thank you mr. chairman yes we're fine with those I'm not sure if that's a word concurrable but <laughs> amenable to that I think madam chair we would go ahead and make you an offer um, looking at let's see house bill 2229 it is the motor vehicle sales tax deduction The community theaters, uh, House Bill 2041, House Bill 2662 for the State Fairgrounds Foundation, and the Friends of Cedar Crest tax exemptions. Madam Chair, I also wanted to include the Boys and Girls Club on our initial offer, please. Okay, um, if you'd give us just a minute. Thank you.
So, Mr. Chairman, um, we've looked at this. Um, we do have some heartburn over uh, the four programs that have not passed either chamber. So we just have a little bit of heartburn, actually a lot of heartburn. But um, so we're going to counter with the veterans uh, sales tax exemption, possibly delaying it a year, and uh, the doorstep. Mr. Chairman, I know that's not a real good counter, but we'd ask that you consider it. Thank you. I might put staff on the spot right quick. Um, can you remind me, or, or perhaps uh, the senators can explain the provisions of that veterans sales tax exemption, the limitations, and how that would function? I would refer to staff on that. Okay. The legislature's website is running a, a, a little slow at the moment, so. It's both. <laughs> it might be the internet, not the whole website. Did you just say there's two different websites? If there's a .gov that is it the same? Yeah, I never knew that. Yeah, I was just that. saying I shouldn't have announced that because now everybody has insider baseball <laughs> on .gov. So it will slow down too now. <laughs> yes, there is .gov and it actually is um, considered somewhat more secure. So the, um, the, the most recent version of that is, is Senate sub for House Bill 2036. Um, in it, it uh, would begin I believe January 1 of 2023. Uh, is it a later date than that? Is it yes. July 1 of 20, July 1 of 25? I'm looking at the wrong date here. Um, but uh, it would be uh, provided for uh, disabled veterans with a 50% permanent disability rating or greater. Um, and it would be limited to $24,000 of taxable sales per year sales of motor vehicles, alcoholic beverages, tobacco products, or electronic cigarettes would be excluded, um, as would any purchases that uh, were not made for personal use or were made for the production of income. Uh, the, the bill would require the Department of Revenue to um, produce a, uh, a driver's license sized card for individuals who qualify um, that, that indicates their eligibility for the sales tax exemption, and then they could present that card to the retailers to um, to um, to receive the exemption on qualified purchases. Um, the the Secretary of Revenue, of course, would be able to require the relevant information to prove eligibility prior to the issuance of, of any such cards. Um, and it, I don't know if I mentioned this, it did require an honorable discharge, not not just discharged. So. Um, is that um... so is this limited to just I hear you say it's just 50% disabled and up this yeah. isn't for all veterans yes okay yes. and I'm trying to recall all of the uh, the sales tax exemption piece 
as a retailer, are they required to have any type of form? Do they have to scan this card to, for from the retailer's side, how do they record that sale as being tax exempt? And if they're audited, how do they, how do they provide? Because I, I know for my ag stuff, when I fill out the ag exemption form, that's something the retailer has on file. I have to fill one of those out every year or two. Would that also be a requirement on this? Yeah, my, my understanding is that th that's the way kind of the underlying sales tax laws work as it relates to exempt sales is that the, the retailers are, are to provide kind of a basis that is coded into their system in terms of why it is exempt and this would be um, kind of part of that, just an additional one that exists. Okay. And then from the department's side, um, does the does the veteran submit a list of the different sales or any kind of reports to the department or how do we know when that threshold is met? Do they keep track of that on their own? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, the provisions of the uh, bill do not do not have a provision for an, an annual reporting per se, but it does provide that upon the request of the Secretary of Revenue, the person may need to provide um, a statement executed under oath regarding their sales. So, Mr. Chairman, um, it's it's been a long day. If you wouldn't mind uh, digesting this, taking a break, um, you guys go back at five. Is that correct? Yeah, I think five o'clock is. Yeah, that go doesn't back on give you too much of a break. So, would you mind if we came back on this um, and continued with the sales tax at that time? And we do have another provision that we've been asked. Um, you to consider, and we are asking for another vehicle. Maybe you could get one so that we don't muddy any of these up. It's um, a film income tax credit. Okay. And we would prefer to keep that in a separate um, vehicle. Okay. If so that would be dependent on a, another uh, shell or vehicle then? Yeah. I Unless you're, I mean, amenable to putting it in something else, I, I would prefer at this point to keep it separate. We've done really good on the negotiations so far. We're almost finished, and that's coming in at the last minute. So, um, and honestly, I don't know if it passed your, it passed the Senate and Commerce Committee, not in across the Senate floor, but not in tax. So we're not real okay. familiar with that bill either. Not okay. as much as we would have been if it would have been in a tax committee. Yeah, it, it, it went through our tax committee, but it never did go above the line and, and get passed across the floor. So um, we might be a little bit more familiar with it, but um, I, would, I would like to see another shell. Um, I'm, I'm trying to keep track and looking at the fiscal note. Most of these sales tax exemptions are pretty small. The, the largest one that we have in at this point is the telecommunications. Um, of course, the veteran sales tax exemption would, would impact that a little bit more. And uh, I'm certainly willing to look and see if I'll, I'll visit with leadership on my side and see if we have another shell we could get. But yeah, we could put that, that film tax credit uh, it's not really a sales tax exemption, so we're kind of getting out of our silo here with with what we're trying to do. But if we can get another bill, I'm happy to take a look at that. Okay, that would be great, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I appreciate much appreciated. And then we can finish up the property tax and the sales tax when we came back. Come back if that would be, unless there's more. questions. Yeah, we'll we'll see if we've answers. got the questions answered that we need on the the property tax piece, and then continue on the sales tax. Um, hopefully make some progress. So do you want to just plan on upon adjournment? Uh, or do you go back in at 5 or 5.30? 5.30. Okay. So um, do you want to try 6 or 6.30? Yeah, I want to make sure 
we respect the staff time and everybody's time if if we think we can get wrapped up or at least make some significant progress and allow everybody to go out and get something to eat. I don't want to make people go out to grab a bite to eat and then come back and be late tonight. So 30, 45 minutes upon second adjournment with that, or not second adjournment, I keep saying that. I'm recess, well, I hope second adjournment. chamber to recess. <laughs> I yeah. hope it's not recess this time. Yeah. <laughs> it might uh, be, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you Recess want to go. Recess or adjournment, okay. Yeah, so, that'd be fine. Just, I, w I would even maybe say just 15 minutes on second. That way we can that'll be great. hopefully come back, get some things done, and, and finish up. break for supper or finish up whatever we need to do. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.